We do have a family member in the crowd, uh, Mr. Bob Hyatt, local denizen of Denver, North Denver raised. And uh, Bob's going to come up and tell you a little bit ab about his story. He's Neil's son. Bob? Thanks, Mark. Well, <clears throat> I uh, got an email from Kathy this morning, and she asked me to apologize to everyone for uh, John, Jamie, and her for not being here tonight, but Mark did all that. Um, so I've been speaking here at the Bash for the last five or six years. I started speaking here the year after I found out that Neil Cassidy was my biological father. I was adopted at two weeks of age, found out I was adopted at seven, and started a periodic search for my biological families at 21. In the early 90s, I found my mother's side of the family, and when I was 66, armed with a court order, I was able to obtain documentation from the Bureau of Vital Statistics that Neil was, in fact, my father. My genes, well, obviously half of them come from Neil Cassidy, and I suspect my adoption of a relatively nonconformist lifestyle is the result of Neil Cassidy genes. Thank you, Neil Cassidy. Shortly after I met Kathy, Jamie, and John, Kathy sent me a family tree. The family tree was researched and, and uh, uh, researched by an extended uh, Cassidy family member, and it went back to the 16th century in England. I noticed a name on the family tree from about 500 years ago, and then <clears throat> I learned that, uh, that name from a History of Western Civilizations class that I'd taken at CU. The name was Oliver Cromwell. Wow, I thought. Not only do I have half my genes from Neil Cassidy, but I have another ancestor who's historically significant. But then I thought about it, and I read a little bit about the human genome. And I realized that whatever uh, genes Oliver passed on to me are essentially meaningless. And here's why. Each person has about 19,000 genes. The first generation acquires half that number of genes from each parent. The second generation acquires a quarter of their genes from the, each grandparent. And the third generation gets an eighth of their genes from their great parents, grandparents, and so forth. This means that Oliver Cromwell's relative, 10 generations later, would get only 18 of Oliver's 19,000 genes. Since I'm approximately the 25th generation, I guess you get the picture. I learned another, uh, about another ancestor on my family tree. This ancestor lived much further back in time. Uh, I don't have a name, it was so far back. This ancestor lived 250,000 years ago. That's just way too far back. This ancestor turns out to be a fish. <laughs> Evolutionary biologists tell us that everyone's ancestor back that time was a fish. Now I'm aware that not everyone believes in the scientific explanation for life on Earth and the process of evolution through natural selection. I know there are those that believe in mythological or supernatural ideas about how life started on Earth. But for those of us that believe in a scientific explanation, isn't it a fantastically interesting story? Neil was a very intelligent guy. I think he would have been fascinated by the discovery of DNA and what scientists are learning about how genes affect human behavior. So I'm going to conclude with a short story from my book. I was about 14 at the time, and it was a time when nonconformity was a strong force in my life. 
and when my concern for consequences wasn't. Encyclopedias 58. Clyde's bedroom was bursting at the seams with all of his stuff. Although the family of three was poor, his mom usually gave Clyde money to buy most of the things that he wanted. He bought new clothes throughout the year, not just for Christmas and at the beginning of each school year like most of the kids in our neighborhood. He always had money for pop and candy and the latest issues of Hot Rod and Mad Magazines. We listened to our favorite doo-wop records bought by Clyde's mom on Clyde's own record player. No one else I knew had his own record player. I liked hanging out with Clyde uh, not only because of his stuff, but he came up with unrivaled ideas for having fun. For example, target shooting in Clyde's living room. When his grandmother was away from the house and his mother was at work, out came the bolt action rifle. Our favorite targets were the volumes of Clyde's set of encyclopedias. The match set of expensive books given to Clyde by a concerned aunt was intended to help him in, uh, have an interest in school and assist him in raising his failing grades. The handsome set of volumes proved perfect targets for indoor shooting because the publisher's embossed seal on the front cover of each book served as a bullseye. <clears throat> and the books were thick enough to stop 22 caliber bullets. When we had the opportunity for shooting, we moved the bookcase that displayed the encyclopedias to the far end of the living room. By turning the open-ended open -ended bookcase sideways, the embossed seals on the covers of two books were clearly visible, one book on the top shelf and one on the bottom. We took aim from near the front door, which was the furthest possible spot from the target, and following a succession of shots and the obliteration of the seals on these two books, we rotated other volumes into the target area and resumed shooting. After a shooting match, we returned the bookcase to the <clears throat> to the usual position, careful to keep the unmangled volumes on the outsides of each row, and this way the bullet holes were hidden from anyone who merely glanced at the bookshelf. And we always picked up the small craps, uh, scraps of paper from the floor uh, that had been shredded from the book's pages. We sprayed air freshener and we opened the windows and doors to disperse the gun smoke odor. One afternoon when Clyde was away from home, his grandmother tried to use the encyclopedias to find an answer to a question posed by a visiting church elder. When she pulled the book from the shelf, the confused woman found a large hole in the center of the book. The hole was surrounded by many smaller holes spaced at various distances from the larger one. She opened the cover and saw the full extent of the damage. Inside, the text was unreasonable, unreadable, readable, excuse me. As Clyde's uh, grandmother and the church official examined other uh, volumes, they found pieces of metal that they were able to identify as mangled bullets. The two citizens were aghast. The tiny portions of lead that had torn through the books, shredding, tearing, and crimping the paper, and making it difficult to open some of the volumes without further ripping the pages. Clyde told his mother he shot the book to pieces because he was bored. Still, the traumatized mother did get rid of the rifle and she threw away the set of encyclopedias with the rest of that week's trash. And she pled with Clyde to please never tell the uh, generous aunt about their disappearance. Thanks, everybody.